everyone, welcome to this episode of Focus On with myself, Fifi Peters. In today's episode, we are looking at the battery minerals opportunity in Africa, a continent rich with the critical minerals required to power the electric future. We'll be joined by Wusun Bofu, who is the sector lead for mining and chemicals over at Nedbank. So we'll see, uh, once again, thanks so much for your time. So we're going to talk about a uh, area I think that you are having a whole lot of conversations mm. about, given the uh, energy transition that is taking place and the need for all industries to play their part. So I want to talk about battery minerals specifically and uh, some of the uh, trends that and the appetite that you are seeing in the battery minerals complex in Africa. Uh, thanks, Fifi. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, it is certainly a very exciting time uh, with the energy transition as it is unfolding. And I think uh, once we came out of the renewable space per se, uh, with the wind farms and the uh, PV farms, we're now moving into an area of the storage element of that whole energy transition. And that's exactly where the battery minerals come in. And, you know, there would be a subset of our overall transition minerals. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of um, excitement building up around that. Uh, from a mining sector perspective, mining is driven by human consumption and the use case. So now that we are in this phase of global consumption and demand for uh, the transition minerals and battery minerals, we're seeing developments going into um, assets that will produce uh, the minerals that are going to feed this energy transition as it rolls out. Uh, from an African perspective, of course Africa will be endowed with your coppers, your cobalts, uh, graphite, in the case of South Africa, manganese. The issue really that um, uh, we have to tussle with is one of making sure that there is a strong uh, demand for those particular minerals into the foreseeable future. And I say foreseeable future because the rate of technological change does present risks if uh, an asset is developed for a particular commodity which in the next five, ten years is rendered obsolete by technological advancement. So that does create um, a, a bit of a risk in terms of the investments that go into it. So how is it then managed? And it has to be management, managed by strong uh, partnerships uh, from government. You need that policy certainty. Then you also need off-takers, long-term off-take contracts that will commit to actually purchasing uh, the commodity and the output that comes out of a particular operation. The handicaps that we see, um, it takes us back to a problem that we've been talking about uh, in South Africa and probably for Africa as a whole which is one of uh, exploration and the levels and pace of development of new assets uh, coming on stream. If we look at the numbers, you know, this is uh, from, an, uh, from s and uh, we, we know that there's been a steady decline in the investment uh, uh, that Africa is able to attract in terms of global spend on the exploration side. It's dipped from uh, 5.4 in the case of South Africa, 5.4 in 2015 to 0 0.8 in 2022. And, and that doesn't behove well for a future where we're able to uh, ride the wave of that demand for uh, these particular transition minerals. Sure. Yeah. But uh, if you look at what has happened over that time period, I mean, there has been quite a number of crises that uh, uh, investors, uh, countries all over have had to grapple with from the uh, recent pandemic uh, to the ongoing uh, geopolitical tensions as it were but I think most uh, significantly perhaps it has also been the elevated uh, rate of borrowing costs and the increased pace in which your costs did go up. We are seeing a bit of a turn in terms of the direction of the cost of money sure. uh, with uh, the, the global system as it were uh, preparing for a, a lowering of interest rates in key economies like the US, like the Eurozone and even uh, over in the UK, even here in South Africa. And I just want to know whether you reckon that the 
trend of a declining spend in exploration then could look a little bit brighter going forward, just given that some of the economic pressures that have been with us in our recent past are beginning to loosen? Yeah, so of course the, uh, the cycle turning in, in terms of uh, the interest rate cycles now is having stabilized and largely forecast to start coming down in the latter half of the year does mean that one, you're going to have decreased uh, pressure on the uh, financial costs for all industries, mining included. Uh, similarly, you're going to see um, um, a quest for yield. Look, all investment is all about trying to get yield. So to the extent that cash source ceases to be an asset class that attracts that yield, then there will be a shift into other investment and other asset classes. Mm. So for sure we can't uh, discount the fact that there will be um, some funds that do come into mm -hmm. uh, mining and exploration, particularly for the critical minerals that we're talking about. But uh, going for uh, going back to uh, uh, where we started the conversation, just looking at battery minerals and all that in Africa, um, having spoken to quite a number of the government officials here at the Indaba, mm -hmm. uh, recognizing the fact that you know, under their uh, feet uh, they hold a lot of these deposits, but they are also uh, having the argument of saying that they want to actually build some of these batteries and these storage cap capacities here on the continent rather than just exporting the minerals and then afterwards importing the, uh, the, the, the product finished. Mm -hmm. uh, just your thoughts on that and the role mm -hmm. that uh, financiers uh, like Nedbank mm -hmm. potentially have to play in making that happen? Um, this is a, an important question, no doubt. And it's something that um, African miners are becoming, not African miners, but African countries are becoming more and more vocal about in terms of trying to um, have more in-country beneficiation mm. because we do have a crisis of a young population which does not have opportunities to participate further in the value chain in terms of manufacturing and growing an industrial base which actually retains more value that is derived from those resources in country. So absolutely an important debate. Um, but what we have to be cognizant of mm. in that whole debate is um, the, consum the markets that we're producing for so first of all, we've got to be able to know that when we develop these industries, we've put in place the policies that attract the investment into these particular industries. That starts with making sure that we've got the processing zones mm -hmm. where we have beneficial tax incentives, that kind of thing. That's how you generate participation, particularly in the manufacturing sector, where you're able to provide, I, I don't want to start a debate about some protectionist policies, but you've got to have enabling policies to make sure that there is an element of in-country beneficiation. I think it's, a, it's an imperative that um, we really have to uh, think about seriously in Africa if we want to solve our broader socio-economic problems. And uh, again, uh, to the topic of beneficiation, uh, 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 nice to have probably for a lot of economies, but uh, whether it's a possible in all economies is debatable, mm. according to a view that says that, I mean, you look at uh, certain uh, countries on the continent, they perhaps don't have enough uh, power capacity within themselves as, bo as, as, as countries mm. to embark on such a big and uh, important uh, task such as beneficiation, whereas uh, some uh, countries do. So it's a question around comparative advantage, Absolutely. essentially. And I just, I just uh, from, from, from your point of view as, 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 as NetBank, I wonder if you would agree, I mean, you did say absolutely, mm -hmm. but you would agree that while beneficiation is an absolute uh, fantastic thing, it's not all countries that are currently in the position to do so at this present moment in time. And, 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 and that's a tragedy of it, isn't it? Because now you're taking the discussion away from a theoretical, uh, just approach to uh, exploiting resources to the realities. Where you do not have competitive advantage, you are destined to fail. The success of uh, China's productive capacity has been their singular focus on being able to produce at low cost and over the years coming up the quality curve as well and delivering all of that in a more efficient manner than anybody else in the world can.
That's why you've seen a displacement of manufacturing capacity. Uh, not only, you know, you can reference South African textile industry as our personal experience, but you go to the United States, you go to Australia and to Europe, where you can see that over time that productive capacity moved uh, towards the east. So that was because they had the uh, frameworks from a legislative perspective. They had the infrastructure from power and logistics to be able to bring in raw materials from Africa, one may say, and be able to get product out to the consumptive economies. Um, and until we're able to have an end-to-end -end, uh, solution that sure. factors in all those things, we are still in the realms of a more emotive discussion mm. as opposed to one that is actually actionable. And, and that's really where the gap lies. We've got to be able to understand the full value chain mm. and the investment required. So it's not just about saying we want beneficiation. You've got to be able to have the infrastructure to support that industrial base. You've got to have the infrastructure to support getting uh, outputs to market. Um, otherwise, we are not uh, really making sure that the problem is solved end to end. Sure. I mean, it, uh, as you said, it yeah. needs to be less emotional and a lot more practical. But Absolutely. another uh, element in your space that uh, needs a lot more practicality right now is that around the responsibility on sourcing a lot of these uh, minerals that will be critical for all these uh, mm. energy storage or solutions that we're talking about. Yeah. And I just uh, would like to understand the lens that you're looking at uh, as a bank in terms of sustainability and uh, responsibility when it comes to sourcing these critical uh, these critical minerals um, so we pride ourselves in being supporters of responsible miners okay. so we dedicate quite a large amount of time in all our assessments of um, risks before we partner with a company on those particular elements uh, broadly speaking if I can draw the lens out a bit mm. responsible sourcing mm. is now being used um, as more a political tool as well because there is a presupposition that if um, a commodity is sourced in a geography which we do not like then we say it's not responsibly sourced mm. so the only way you know we can really approach this is to be able to deal with countries that are transparent uh, and entities that are, are transparent so that we show that all the inputs that ultimately go into the consumptive outputs that we all consume have been sourced in a responsible way. And from a net bank perspective, we're quite pedantic about that uh, because we are signatories to a number of the uh, protocols that require us to have that kind of diligence within our risk framework when we're approaching transactions. So you're not the Green Bank for nothing at no, this no, present no. moment in time. But we'll yeah. see. Thanks to you uh, so much for sharing these insights with us. So we'll leave it there. Thank you, Fifi. Always a pleasure. And that wraps up today's Focus On. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. Until next time, it's goodbye.